what I thought would be interesting to talk about is, uh, to think about is the kind of, the thing about a prize, which is really cultural noise, and then, which is sort of in the media, and what's the opinion formers, and you know, it's the chattering classes, all of us. But then also to look at what's really going on in bookshops and in people's reading lives. So I have some facts for you. First fact, which I'm sure will not come as no surprise to anyone in this room, is that women dominate the fiction market. We buy more, we sell more, we write more, we read more. And I'm talking about literary fiction here. So there was a consumer study last year, for example, that said that in the last 12 months, women bought 60% of literary fiction, men bought 40% and were end users, which I guess is reading, uh, <laughs> of 31%. But I think, against that background, I think in the media, at the very least, that we're still, and in other places too, are very much hung up on the notion that the great novel is written by men. And I ask you, am I the only one to notice, for example, that a new book by, say, Ian McEwan or Martin Amos is an event, as opposed to a new book by Martin Amos, Martin or, or Amos or Ian McEwan? And when John Updike died recently, there were pieces on the radio and in the paper bemoaning the, the death of the great American novel, now that only Roth was left, Me Bellow, Mailer, Updike being the pantheon. Well, I'm not the only one who's noticed this, and men have noticed it as well. And I was very pleased to read in the Sunday Times uh, a couple of years ago, Brian Appleyard, who wrote, there's something a bit testosterone-laden about this view of the great novel. Mailer was probably the most extreme example of writer as the big, tough guy, which is odd. Nobody's preoccupied with the masculinity of Tolstoy or Dickens. Now, though, the great novel writing is regarded as the pursuit of male heading out into the woods and shooting stuff. That's Brian Appleyard speaking. And then he went on to say, presciently, the two greatest living writers are women, Marilyn Robinson and Shirley Hazard. Both are quiet, unhyped, and deadly serious. While Marilyn Robinson, as Kate says, now much better known in this country thanks to the Orange Prize last year. And then I looked at, sort of, at the Booker Prize as being indicative of what the British literary establishment has considered most attention worthy over the last 40 years. And a clear preference emerges there, as which is why we first started talking about the Orange Prize. In the first 30 years, the shortlist was 63% male, 36% female. When the Orange Prize was set up in the years from 91 to 95, only five women were shortlisted compared to 24 men. And since the Orange Prize has been um, going, 56 men shortlisted compared to 32 women. Not saying women aren't re winning these prizes, as you know they have. Um, over the last 15 years, women have won six times and men nine. But it's not just about numbers, this is about sort of perception really, isn't it? Women write more fiction, read more fiction, but I still feel that there's a sense that the good male novelist is regarded as more noteworthy. And again, another man who's picking this up was um, Jonathan Coe, writing in The Guardian. He said, perhaps one shouldn't read too much into these statistics, yet do they not imply that while the reading public now has no hesitation in embracing and indeed privileging the work of women writers, which I think is true too, the female novelists might still feel that the ultimate imprimatur of literary status, that indefinable sense of being taken seriously, still dangles tantalizing out of reach. So again, so I'm talking about sort of what's in the ether and then what we know. I wonder that if one of the things I was thinking about is that maybe the problem is around, around who writes the great novel is the confusion between genre and gender. So you have men's genre writing, and that's labeled crime, adventure, SAS, and it's not called men's writing. And yet genre writing for women, chick lit, romance, family saga, is called women's writing. And so somehow you have literary writing by men remaining quite separate from male genre writing in a way that literary writing by women does not. And I also think there's, there is that age old problem that if you write about the intimate, if you write about love and feelings, you've written a domestic novel instead of fiction about big, important things. Um, Rachel Cusk, a well-known British writer, says, the woman writer takes a big risk in taking femaleness and female values as her subject. And I was just riveted just recently, I listened to Helen Simpson, who was on Woman's Hour, who was asked, slightly criticized, I thought, really, for writing domestic short stories. And her answer, I thought, was completely brilliant. She said, calling a work of fiction domestic is a political, not a literary judgment. That was good. 
Elaine Showalter, who we publish, who's written literature of their own and a jury of their peers, she says she thinks that women novelists don't claim their space. So she said, this is a quote from her, she said, women have been too dignified and self-effacing to make their own claims to artistic immortality. Women novelists do not observe the rituals of male literary artistry that sustain historical memory. They rarely produce, produce manifestos, align themselves in a notable school, name their generation, whether lost or beat, and their genre, or feud heroically and publicly. And then she gave a really good example, I thought, is that if you don't name yourself, you get named. So someone from the audience asked her about Chick Lit, and she said, it would have been really interesting that if Bridget Jones and her successors had laid claim to what they were writing and called it, say, what she came up with, romantic realism, it would have had a different cast <laughs> and Chick Lit. And I'm not saying it's a man who called it Chick Lit by any means. It was probably a woman in the publicity department <laughs> or in, in journalism. <laughs> but there you are. If you didn't get, if you don't um, get, if you don't claim your territory, um, you get named. So I, my, my sort of feeling about this is that I'm watching this is that you, you have to claim your territory, you have to call attention to yourself, you have to be visible, and you have to be immodest. But if you look at who's visible in the arts, on the stage, in galleries, in our own parliament, you can see that female invisibility is still an issue. And also, interestingly, I think modesty is too. I think it's still better, perhaps safer, but certainly nicer and better behaved if women are modest, if we wait for the accolades, the attention, the praise, rather than act as if it's our due. And modesty, that female virtue, is in direct conflict, I think, with women who stand up, stand up in any way, writing the novel, directing a play, taking place in the cabinet. However, back to writing. The funny thing is, I think, that this recognition, this fame, this stature, the prizes, the noise, is actually what goes on out in the ether and in the media. But what actually goes on in the bookshops is different. There, women writers are hugely successful, varied, bestsellers. And I'm talking not genre here, but literary fiction by women. But out in the cultural world, with the noisemakers and the opinion formers, the indisputable thing the Orange Prize does, as indeed does Virago, is claim space, immodestly, for writing by women. Now, of course, that gets a lot of flack, not least that male writers are excluded. Not male readers, but male writers. But I haven't noticed any other area of the art world, or even the political world, being defensive about programs that have mainly men on it. So, my view is that until the world changes a lot, I think it's all to the good that Orange Prize makes a very big noise about writing by women. Because the thing that, about the Orange Prize is it's visible, it's not modest, and that, to my mind, is a very great thing. Yeah. <laughs>